Humphreys 7 Expedition Team is ready. Departure is set for February 15th. I'm Admiral Richard Byrd Jr. Since retiring from the Navy in 2015, I've dedicated myself to exploring Antarctica with the United States Antarctic Program. The program regularly recruits teams of scientists, explorers, and glacial specialists. My role is to guide and accompany them on their journey to the South Pole, where we conduct experiments and studies that deepen our understanding of our planet. Over the years, these missions have revealed astonishing things. And I'm not just talking about the scientific findings. To fully grasp this story, you'll need to open your mind a bit. Antarctica is a harsh and unforgiving place, home to species uniquely adapted to its climate. It's a land brimming with mysteries, and I'm here to share them with you in detail. This is my testimony. On October 20th, 2021, I got a call from Colonel Wilkes, who typically assigns me to Antarctic exploration missions. Hey, Bird, how are you? Listen, I've got a new mission for you. Ready to brave the cold again? It's been a while, and we're short-staffed. We should take advantage of the Southern Hemisphere's upcoming summer. Wilkes, you read my mind. Just give me the date, and I'll be there. Same kind of mission, right? Or is there something new? Business as usual, Bird. We stick to the plan unless told otherwise. You know they don't share many details with us. The last mission ended a bit oddly, but that's how these things go sometimes. You know what I mean? All water under the bridge. Let's get it right this time and steer clear of any trouble. Just let me know the date and I'll start preparing. That's what I like to hear, Bird. I'll give you a call as soon as we've got the date. For now, prep as you usually would. We should have everything sorted out by the end of summer. True to his word, Wilkes was always on point. By February 15th, we were at Christchurch International Airport in New Zealand, kicking off our mission with a five-member team, a glacier specialist, a biologist, a veterinarian skilled in rare species, General Wright, who handled the logistics with me, and I was in charge of guiding this team on our mission, Deep Freeze 7. The mission's goal was to track down, and I dare say hunt, a sea monster, a type of mutant whale spotted by numerous explorers. It was no ordinary species. This aggressive creature was blamed for the vanishing of entire teams of explorers and scientists in Antarctica. Naturally, we kept this detail from our team. The last thing such a mission needed was the prying eyes of the media. Officially, we were on the lookout for rare species. This was what Colonel Wilkes hinted at regarding the previous expedition. The Deep Freeze 6 mission had been quite a saga, leading to some unexpected fallout. That time, we were accompanied by four climatologists. Our objective was to assess the melting of the polar caps and the extreme weather conditions of Antarctica. On the morning of the incident, we set out to investigate a glacier suspected of imminent calving. The conditions were far from ideal. We left from Sheriff Base early in the summer, so daylight wasn't an issue. The real challenge was the fierce winds buffeting Livingston Island. Nonetheless, we braved the elements and made our way to the coast near the large glacier, where we waited. The cold was piercing through our skin, and I must admit, even after years on these missions, the thrill of being in such a secluded part of the world still excites me. Every day felt like living in a documentary, and the atmosphere of these lands, a blend of silence and solitude, can unnerve even the stoutest of hearts. Even though it seemed uneventful to me, the scientists were fascinated by taking samples and making evaluations. About three or four hours later, we heard a deep rumbling that shook the ground beneath us. We instantly knew it was a pivotal moment. We moved closer to get a better view of the glacier calving, and just as we braced for the spectacle, a blizzard engulfed us. A thick fog obscured everything, making it impossible to see even six feet ahead. I could still hear people nearby, and then it felt as if the ground cracked under me. A sudden light made me look down as though a large hatch had opened in the darkness. I knelt to prevent myself from falling. 
and about 10 seconds later, everything settled. As I stood up, the fog slowly lifted, exposing the horizon, but I saw a crack under my feet and a precipice in front of me. The ground where we had stood had fractured, and within moments, four people had vanished, leaving only me behind. Just me, staring at the now absent glacier, which had either plunged into the sea or who knows where. I quickly radioed the base for support, and in about half an hour, two vehicles arrived at my location. The weather had deteriorated again, forcing us to head back to the base. On the way, I recounted what had happened. I expected some surprise from them, but I only received attentive silence. Some exchanged knowing glances, which was far from reassuring. Upon returning to the base, we all gathered in the center of the room warmed by the heater. Sipping bourbon, they began to reveal to me that what had happened wasn't new. From that point on, my perspective on these expeditions shifted. Listen up, bird. None of this is going public. The official story will be that Deep Freeze 6 was a success. Someone will brief you on what to tell the media, the positive outcomes, and what's next. They are the ones calling the shots. And you're now part of this. Who are they? The government? The media? The main thing is the project goes on. But trust me, there are odd occurrences out here that the world isn't ready to know, and our job is to keep the research going. Just follow their lead, and you'll find the answers you're looking for. Stay in the game. And so, I've stayed in the game. I'm gearing up for a new mission, but this time I have a few more answers than before. The objective of Deep Freeze 7 is to continue the investigations, which is why we decided to give the team a bit more information. Officially, we're in search of rare species, but we never mention the much-talked-about sea monster, a creature rumored to haunt the polar seas. Sailors here claim to have seen it, and those who don't, unfortunately, often become its prey. Beyond that, little is known and even less is discussed. But there we were, the team assembled, ready for the journey to Morambio Airport on Seymour Island, a trip as far from ordinary as one can imagine, especially the landing. The runway is entirely ice. Arriving there, it's immediately clear you're entering a world of unique conditions. However, once settled, you encounter colleagues from across the globe. Antarctica hosts scientists and explorers from Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Australia, and other nations. The excitement is palpable. Stories, myths, and insider tales start to circulate. For the three first-timers, it's like being reborn. They're joining an exclusive club where life is forever altered. That evening, at Marambio Base, I held a brief meeting with the team to discuss our plans. The following morning, we were scheduled to head to Sheriff Base, the site of our mission. This American base operates only during the South Pole's summer. There, we would establish our base for the investigation. Whether they managed to sleep that first night, I'm not sure. The adrenaline must have been overwhelming. But the next day, our plans went off without a hitch. By 6.30 a.m., we found a break in the weather and flew by helicopter to Sheriff Base. Seizing the opportunity provided by the favorable weather, we embarked on a short exploration trip upon our arrival. Naturally, our team was brimming with questions. The previous night, they had interacted with members of the Argentine mission at Marambio Base, and were now buzzing with various theories and legends they had heard. Sir, with your extensive experience in these missions, you must know something beyond what we do, some secret, Something we should be cautious about. Are we in any danger? Coming to such a remote part of the world always involves danger, and I understand you're full of questions right now. I've been in your shoes. Don't worry. Antarctica will reveal its secrets in due time. I wasn't entirely convincing, I could tell. His gaze drifted toward the horizon. At that moment, we stood atop a hill with minimal snowfall. The sun was shining, 
though it didn't lessen the biting cold. It did, however, offer a breathtaking view of the wild ocean crashing against the shore, a sight unique to this enigmatic place. We spent the rest of the day planning the next day's exploration. Everything had to be meticulously prepared, visual and physical samples, notes, and anything necessary to document our findings. While the mission didn't have a set return date, we aimed to conclude by mid-March, before the end of summer. This gave us ample time to schedule substantial outings, weather permitting, an unpredictable factor we always had to keep in mind. The atmosphere in the common room was tense with anticipation. We all sat together sharing stories and discussing our experiences. I tried to instill confidence in the team, drawing on my years of experience in these territories. I showed them maps, outlining routes, and recounting previous missions, carefully omitting certain details for obvious reasons. The last thing I wanted was to incite panic just before we commenced our research. My constant advice remained the same. Eat well, sleep well, and cloak yourself in anticipation so it doesn't catch you off guard. Antarctica's endless daylight during summer necessitated my emphasis on the importance of rest. The days seem infinite, and physical fatigue often doesn't align with the mental signal to sleep. Ironically, that night, despite my experienced advice, I couldn't find rest myself. I awoke drenched in sweat from a nightmare where I met a grim end, being dragged into the depths of the frozen sea, struggling for air against an unknown force. With favorable weather on our side again, there was no time to lose. The team geared up for a mountain exploration at 8 a.m. We anticipated a three to four hour journey subject to any sudden change in the climate. General Wright remained at the base tracking us via GPS. Our communication, as always, was through radio with codes ready for any emergency. We were well prepared for any eventuality. Stepping out into the first morning breeze in Antarctica is an experience in itself. Feeling negative 10 degrees against your skin, despite all efforts to protect it, is like being pierced by icy needles. Yet, the air is the purest, the sky the bluest, the sun the brightest. Extremes define this place. About two hours into our walk, we approached a massive, pyramid-shaped mountain, frozen like much of Antarctica. I recalled some old notes from the Deep Freeze 4 mission. One scientist had observed strange energy in the area, resembling an electromagnetic field. While exploring this wasn't our primary goal, the team, brimming with anticipation and a thirst for discovery, decided to spend time recording observations. As their guide, my role was mainly oversight, but I believe in not limiting ourselves to planned findings. So I allowed them to pursue what they felt could enrich the mission. That was when the biologist made a discovery. This wall is peculiar. It's not just the shape. It looks out of place here as if it doesn't belong to the mountain. He made this observation while examining a massive wall partially exposed from the snow-laden mountain. Intrigued, we all gathered to touch the stone, feeling an energy coursing through it, flowing like the current of a river. In a collective silence, we explored different parts of the rock, almost as if searching for a flaw, a hidden element, something that might reveal a secret passage or a hatch. Then, the current within the walls began to transfer into our bodies, delivering a series of electric shocks that left us momentarily paralyzed. We were lifted two feet off the ground. Unable to turn and see the others, my peripheral vision confirmed this was happening to everyone. Our mouths were immobile, preventing any screams or words, leaving us with only the sound of the breeze and the silence of the inhospitable South Pole. As we faced the mountain, it split in two from top to bottom, emitting a blinding light. The brightness was intense, nearly searing. Fortunately, I could still blink, so I chose to close my eyes and surrender to the experience. During this, I felt my body slowly advancing forward. The electricity continued to course through me, 
not painful, but completely restraining my movement. Time seemed irrelevant, but eventually, I regained some control over my body. Opening my eyes, I was confronted with a sight that felt familiar, but one I had never seen before. Hovering before me was a being surrounded by a blue aura. Its height was remarkable, easily exceeding eight feet, and it appeared to be wearing a suit that was fused to its body. Its eyes were completely white, and it had an emotionless expression on its face. It reached out a hand toward me, a gesture that seemed like a thank you, though we were too far apart for physical contact. Its mouth remained still, yet I heard its voice in my mind. Your contributions are invaluable to our research. I acknowledge your bravery. The answers you seek will be implanted in your mind. As I stood there, the three scientists floated by, still immobilized. Their eyes, glossy with tears, met mine as they drifted past, a moment etched in my memory. I wanted to say something, anything, but words failed me in my shock. At that instant, I felt a deep sense of guilt. I had betrayed a team that trusted me implicitly. Yet, what choice did I have? This was beyond any of us, beyond mere personal ethics. It was about humanity, the world. Answers come, and they will come for all of humanity in time. With these thoughts whirling in my mind, I left the mountain. I reached for the radio. General Wright, come in. Mission accomplished.